Continental Industries offers the highest quality and the most complete line of residential and light commercial grills, registers, and diffusers. We make them all right here in the USA, and 2015 marks our 60th anniversary. Continental Industries, because everyone needs to vent. Learn more at continentalindustries.com. Good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar, Proper Selection of Grills, Registers, and Diffusers. This event, brought to you by the ECHR News, is sponsored by Continental Industries in partnership with National Comfort Institute. I'm your moderator, Kyle Guerrero, Editor-in-Chief of the News. Thanks for joining us today. Today's presenter is David Richardson, Curriculum Direct, Direct Developer, Trainer at National Comfort Institute. David joined NCI full-time in 2010 as the curriculum developer and trainer. In this role, he develops and teaches practical, real-world training focused on the HVAC and home performance industries. He has been involved in performance-based contracting since 2001. This experience allows him the opportunity to diagnose and correct numerous HVAC and home performance issues over the past decade. David writes monthly columns for various industry publications to help increase awareness on the importance of performance testing and is a regular presenter at many industry conferences. In addition to holding all NCI certifications, David has held certifications as a HERS Rater, BPI Building Analyst, and as a BPI Field and Written Exam Proctor. Before we begin the presentation, I want to provide you with a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a taskbar. Each icon on the taskbar is assigned to a particular element of today's webinar. If you're unsure about what an icon does, Hover over the icon with your mouse and a box will pop up that tells you the function. A copy of today's presentation is located in the handouts icon. Please take our survey following the webinar by clicking on the survey icon in the taskbar. Below the audio box, there is a blank question box that allows you to type a question in the box and then hit the submit button to send it to us. Later in this live program, our presenter will address as many questions as possible. Today's event is being recorded and archived on achrnews.com. All registered participants will receive an email within one or two business days that has a link to view a recording of this event. This course is approved for one hour of continuing education, or .1 CEU. To qualify for the credit, you must watch the webinar in its entirety and complete the quiz at the end of the session at the cecampus.com. For a link to the quiz, please click on the handouts icon at the bottom of the screen. DNP Media is an accredited provider by the International Association for Continuing Education and Training. In obtaining this accreditation, DNP has demonstrated that it complies with ANSI IACET standard, which is recognized internationally as a standard of good practice. As a result, DNP Media is authorized to offer IACET CEUs for this program that qualifies on the, under the ANSI standard. This presentation is protected by U.S. and international copyright laws. Reproductions, distribution, display, and use of this presentation without written permission of the speaker is prohibited. The learning objectives, objects are important topics for all attendees. At the end of this course, participants should be able to know the effects of register and grill selection on room airflow patterns, identify the characteristics and applications of various grills, registers, and diffusers, properly use and apply information contained in manufacturer's grill and register engineering data, and determ properly determine the size and style of supply registers and return grills for the needed application. But enough of all my information. Let's get to the good stuff. I'm going to turn it over to David Richardson for the presentation. Take it away, David. Thank you, Kyle. appreciate the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, depending on where you're located, it's going to be either good morning or good afternoon. We really appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today and listen to what we've got to say. You know, every season, guys, it seems like you've got cooling and heating problems that you're trying to figure out why certain rooms are uncomfortable. The root of this problem oftentimes can revolve around something so overlooked and simple as the proper selection of grills, registers, and diffusers. There are certain instances also that you're going to encounter comfort issues that you simply can't overcome, as diligent as you may have been when it comes to selection and your research of grills, registers, and diffusers. 
it's my hope that once we go through this webinar that you guys are going to look completely different at registers and diffusers and that you're also going to see possibly streamers, magnetic scoops, anything of that line as a visual clue. Something that's saying that your services are needed in that comfort department. So let's take a look at what we're going to be looking at this afternoon. To go through the uh, preview, guys, we're going to be looking at, uh, there's more to registers than just typical stamp face design. When I first got into this industry, to me a register and a grill was nothing more than a device that was used to cover a rough opening. Once I was introduced to the engineering data behind this and taught how to read it, it completely opened up my view to how these devices actually work. We're also going to look at some definitions and abbreviations. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of mixed terminology in how it's used when it comes to grills, registers, and diffusers. So we're going to try to clear up a little bit of that. We're also going to look at air mixing zones, occupied zones, and take a look at some of the important work that supply registers and diffusers actually do. Then we'll get into a little bit of terminology, breaking things down, making it a little bit simpler to understand when you're looking at the engineering data. After we've done that and we've laid that foundation, then we're going to look at the engineering data. So we'll also look at some situations that you guys are probably encountering with uh, variable refrigerant flow systems, multi-speed equipment, where you might not be getting the performance characteristics out of the registers and diffusers that you think you should. There's a reason for that, and we're going to talk about some of the basics that go behind that. Once you've done all your prep work, your research, your design, there's some external factors that you need to consider, though, that may prevent you from having an issue when it comes to your systems performing as they're designed. We're going to look at some of those. Uh, a lot of these range not only from comfort, but also up to safety issues that can be created unintentionally. We're going to look at some of the cause and effect that ties to that. And then to round it up, we're going to talk about some of the opportunity that's available through offering what we call performance-grade registers and grills. This is a huge opportunity and one of the most overlooked things when it comes to an HVAC system, although it's what your customers typically see. Now, when we look at what a supply register or a diffuser does, a well-placed supply register that's, say, delivering 150 cubic feet per minute of air can easily condition 1,500 to 3,000 cubic feet of room air, 10 to 20 times that amount. The principle behind this is what's called air entrainment. And what's happening is the higher velocity supply air that's coming out of that register diffuser, which is often referred to as primary air, starts to entrain the air of the room. And this is often referred to as secondary air. When this occurs, these two bodies of air mix together. Now, how well this air entrainment is accomplished is going to be determined by how well the register allows air from the duct system to mix with the air in the room. So this is where supply register and diffuser characteristics come in so important. As air from the duct system leaves the register, it gets compressed and forced through the veins of that register. When this action doesn't take place properly in a room, the air in that room doesn't get set into motion as it needs to. So when this important work's not accounted for, you may find yourself experiencing certain issues such as large temperature variations, uh, air that seems stagnant, and on the opposite side of that, even drafts. So supply registers and diffusers have a really important job when it comes to setting room air into motion. Now, there's some abbreviations that we need to get down before we continue to go. There's a lot of confusion when it comes to the terminology of grills, registers, and diffusers. And guys, I'll admit, I am often guilty of referring to them incorrectly just based off of prior experience and also when I'm trying to simplify an explanation. So I'll work on that. To get us all on the same page for this presentation, though, let's look at some of the accepted definitions of what grills, registers, and diffusers are from the slide that you guys see. A grill is often going to be referred to as a fixed opening through which air passes, and this is often going to be used for return air applications. Uh, an interesting note is that grills will not have any type of a damper behind them. That's going to be reserved for a register and a diffuser. A register is actually a grill that is equipped with a damper, often used to supply conditioned air into the space, typically used on supply air applications. Diffusers are also going to be an airflow de device which is designed to discharge conditioned air in specific directions, a path or a pattern. They are very praised for their air mixing capabilities. And often they'll come in two by two sizes, smaller sizes. When you see these referred to as a lump group of grills, they're typically going to be used by the abbreviation GRD. 
Now, there's also many publications that will refer to the group as are what are called terminal devices or terminal outlets. You will probably hear me use that term interchangeably as we continue to go through this presentation. So now that we've got some of the basics down for grills, registers, and diffusers, let's talk about air mixing zones. Because when we start dealing with conditioning a room properly, we need to understand these two zones inside of a room. The first zone that I want to talk about is an air mixing zone. Now the air mixing zone is typically going to be an area inside of a room that's about two feet in from each wall and the ceiling. And we're going to be referring to this as an air mixing zone. Your customers typically don't occupy this area. The area that they do occupy is what is called the occupied zone. Now this is an area that's located inside the air mixing zone and it begins about two feet inside each wall and from the ceiling and extends down all the way to the floor. Now the occupied zone is where your customers are going to be located. So we're going to take a look at that as we go continue to go through this webinar and some of the ways that the registers and supply diffusers are going to affect this. Our job when you guys are designing registers and grills and diffusers is to make sure that the system supply air being delivered into the air mixing zone gets into that occupied zone at desirable velocities, ideally less than 50 feet per minute in the occupied zone. Let's look at how some of the different supply register and diffusers actually impact this. Now the first that we're going to look at is a four-way ceiling supply register or diffuser and the way that the air mixing goes with this type of an application. Ceiling diffusers tend to be able to handle extremely high airflow rates without the tendency of creating drafts. And the reason they do this is they've got a good ability to mix air better than grills and registers due to the uh, construction of them. There's typically going to be a very strong mi mixing action that occurs at the diffuser. Uh, after that, you're going to find out that's what's called surface effect or coanda effect will typically take over with air distribution. Now, for those of you that might not be familiar with what coanda effect is, it's simply a description that airflow likes to cling to the surfaces that it travels parallel against. So in this example, we're talking about it traveling against the ceiling. Now, in the illustration, you guys will see that the air is traveling across the ceiling until its properties, which typically involve temperature being one of the biggest, face velocity and uh, ceiling material smoothness, the friction factor, start to cause that air to fall away from the ceiling. Or it hits an obstruction. A lot of times you'll have drop ceilings or beams this is often referred to as jet interference. And when that happens, it can break up that air pattern and cause the air just to drop. So looking at this, you'll notice that we're really focusing on the supply register's impact on air movement and not so much on the return. We're going to hit on that in a little bit. Which one has more of an impact when it comes to properly conditioning a room? So let's take a look at how our, uh, another type of an application applies here. And this is floor registers. What we're doing is we're looking at three of the most commons. We just talked about four-way supply registers. In this application, we're going to look at floor registers. So as you're looking at how air is discharged up an outside wall, a lot of times contractors and professionals like to put registers underneath windows, doors, uh, in the largest areas of heat gain and loss inside of a building. So when you look at that, a lot of times there's a, there's a little bit of a method to the madness behind that. The biggest thing is to try to counter, counter set or reduce drafts that are created by convective looping that occurs in front of glass or any type of fenestration like that. What happens is, is the air temperatures start to transfer across that glass, a very poorly insulated material, is it changes the temperature. A lot of times people think, oh, my doors and windows are leaking. Reality is it's just temperature changing. By putting supply registers in the floor, in front of that large area of heat loss and heat gain, you can offset that type of a relationship. makes a big difference. Something else to notice is if you've got uh, supply registers in the floor and they're located near windows that have large drapes that extend out, this can be a good thing and a bad thing. The drapes can actually act as a duct to extend the airflow up across the wall. So if you're shooting to try to get what we call throw, which is something we'll talk about here in a little bit, drapes can extend that. Uh, the other thing that they do, though, is they can prohibit air from mixing in the room as quickly as you might like to. So it's something to be aware of as you're looking at these selection and the characteristics of these grills. Now, the last one that I'd like to take a look at is a one-way ceiling register. 
Now, for those of you in Florida, I know you guys see this a lot. Uh, very common that they're placed near an interior door and air is trying to be thrown across the ceiling to condition an outside wall. Depending on how that room's constructed, that can work well. Uh, it might not. Uh, another aspect that this could be used for is for drop-down ceilings if you're using a supply register coming out the side. This is where the throw comes in so important. We're trying to make sure that all the spaces is being conditioned and that the round room air is set into motion through entrainment. Guys, air motion is important to being comfortable. Any time the velocities inside that occupied zone are too high, you're going to get complaints of draft. Those are often going to be reported to you. On the opposite side of that, if there's not enough air motion, so the air is kind of stagnant, you're also going to get complaints about stuffiness, not enough comfort. So there's a fine line that has to be maintained here. Now, these velocities are also going to be dependent on the location of your customer's bodies because depending on where they're at, the same type of velocity of air moving across, say, their neck, for instance, is going to be much less tolerable than if the, that same air speed is moving across their ankles. So typically air velocities, we'd like to keep below the 50 uh, feet per minute range. Anywhere between 50 to 80 can often be tolerated in the occupied zone, but that's typically going to be for those uh, using any type of light activities. Anytime you get above 200 feet per minute inside that occupied zone, it's going to be extremely uncomfortable for anybody that's in the path of that airstream. So we want to make sure that we tie that down. As we continue through this, you're going to see how, talk about some ways that you can actually measure that with a hot wire or some type of a rotating vane anemometer. There's some terminology that we need to get to first, though. And that'll get us on the same page as we start to look at some of the engineering data for this, for registers, grills, and et cetera. When we look at the size, you're typically looking at the rough opening that that grill register diffuser is going to be tied into. Now, when we're looking at diffusers, a lot of times you're going to be dealing with a neck size, which is going to be based off of the branch duct that's actually feeding that. If you're dealing with registers or grills, it's going to be the rough opening that that terminal device is going to be covering. Face velocity is also average speed of the air at the face of the register. Now, depending on publications that you look at, this is often going to be measured exactly one inch off of the face of that register or grill. Now, face velocities are too low. It can result in improper mixing of the room air and also really kick into temperature stratification. Now, as we continue through this, you guys are going to notice terminal velocity. As we talked earlier about the velocities in the occupied zone, terminal velocity is going to correspond with what's called throw. With terminal velocity, that's how far the air is coming out of a register before it hits that 50 feet per minute or 75 feet per minute range. Now, depending on the manufacturer, they'll use 75 or 50. You'll need to refer to their data to see how they have that grill specified. The reason terminal velocity is important is it lets you know how far the air will throw from a given register or diffuser before it reaches that airspeed. So that way, if you're inside that occupied zone, you're trying to take into account your customer's comfort, this is going to be the criteria that you're going by. Remember, we want to try to keep it less than 50. 50 to 80 is tolerable. That's why we have these ranges that are typically listed by the grill manufacturers. Another term that often gets confused is effective area. When we're dealing with effective area, it's laboratory calculated. You guys, you can't measure this in the field because it's based on how the air is moving between the veins, and it takes up that space that is taken into account as air squeezes through the veins. It's laboratory established, and you're going to often see uh, what are called AK or correction factors based off of this. Now, we often get the question in our training classes, you know, can I use the manufacturer's register correction factor if I don't have anything better. You know, I can't create a field correction factor, and absolutely you can. You need to know that they're designed for rotating vein anemometers, though, originally. But if you have nothing better, it's better than not measuring. But just keep in mind that is not a measured value that you guys are going to be obtaining in the field. Next uh, terminology that we're going to look at is free area. Now, this one can be measured. If you guys are crazy enough to take a tape measure and try to measure up all the free areas, you're a special kind of sick and twisted. Because guys, there is guys that will try to do that, myself included. This is the total of spaces measured in square inches between the veins. Make sure you don't confuse this with effective area. 
It's often done. I know I've done it myself. This is uh, not determined in the laboratory, but this is the actual opening between the veins. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as a daylight measurement, what you're actually seeing going through the veins itself. So completely different than effective area. Another term that you'll see as we start to talk about spread is deflection degrees. And this is the angle that the louvers of the veins are actually manufactured to throw the air at on a spread pattern from the register at a specified angle. These are often going to be anywhere from 0 to 22 to 45 degrees. Uh, other certain registers, high velocity registers, can be adjusted. So it does make a difference. And you'll have to research the data to find out accordingly. When you're looking at location designation, this is typically going to be on a set of plans. Uh, for those of you that are air balancers, it'll also be listed or abbreviated on an air balancing report, and it's going to indicate the location of that register or that grill. And this is going to have a big impact on how the air goes into motion inside of a room. One thing you'll notice, there's no ideal spot based on heating or cooling. You kind of have to find a happy medium. There's no register that really does a great job at both. So we're going to try to meet both those qualifications as we continue through this. Now, it's often asked, is it a grill register or diffuser? Well, registers and diffusers are often going to be used on the supply side of the duct system, while grills are typically used on the return side. So often if you're going to talk about them as a mixed group, the abbreviation GRD works well, or you can use terminal devices. Now, when we're selecting grills, registers, and diffusers, you want to make sure that you check the air volume that they're rated for. This is important. Supply registers, you want to keep in the range of 500 feet per minute, anything above that, and they may start making some noise. We're going to talk about uh, a characteristic called noise criteria here in a minute. Return grills, you want to keep face velocities in the range of 300 to 500 feet per minute. We're going to go into this in more detail as we continue to talk about the registers and diffusers. When you look at pressure drop, Pressure drop is a characteristic that not all manufacturers are going to have. Ideally, if you're dealing on a residential basis, grills and registers should not have anywhere more than a pressure drop of 0 0.03 inches of water column. Now, if you're trying to throw air longer distances, you may have to get a higher pressure drop register. There is a give and a take with this. Be aware that the higher the pressure drop registers that you use, pay special attention to the strength of the fan that you're using in that system and the type of duct system that it's attached to. Because you can do all the design in the world, and if the system doesn't move the amount of airflow, that pressure drop and those corresponding values aren't going to be of a whole lot of detail. So you'll notice that in the highlighted box there that the pressure losses ranging anywhere from 0 0.006 all the way up to 0 0.031, based on the amount of airflow that's going through that register or grill. Notice as the airflow goes up, so does the pressure drop. So it makes a difference, something that needs to be accounted for. Another term, how many of you guys in your offices have boxes of registers and grills that were ordered incorrectly? I know we used to. And it boils down to whether we called off the height or the width first. So whenever you're specifying registers and grills, make the determination where height or width comes first. It's going to depend on the manufacturer. I have seen them done both ways. Product dimensions are typically going to be given width by height, but check your specifications carefully to be sure before you place a large order. Otherwise, you might find a, a lot of extra grills sitting around your shop. Another term that we want to look at is noise criteria. Now, noise criteria is going to be something that's used to rate the noise of air noise when it's coming out of registers. There's going to be times when air noise in a room has to be controlled. Uh, the ideal system, though, if we could do this, would be absolutely silent. But there's a lot of situations that that's just not attainable. You can look in the chart that we've got here, and you'll notice residentially in living areas, bathrooms, we're looking for an NC rating or a noise criteria of 30 to 35. So as you start to get into different applications, commercial, areas where the noise doesn't make that big of a difference, you'll notice that that NC rating goes up. So as you're looking through engineering data, if you're looking to try to keep something quiet, that room particularly quiet, you want to go with the lowest NC rating you can get. Check out on commercial, about three columns down. You get into concert halls, opera houses, anytime there's recordings, an NC rating of 20, almost silent. So it's something to pay attention to is sound is a factor 
when you're designing registers and grills. Now, another issue impacting noise from grills and registers and at the diffusers is also air velocity. As you look at this chart, we've got samples of noise criteria and also air velocity at the supply outlet and return outlet. When these are exceeded, you're going to notice you start to get some kind of nasty noises. Uh, sometimes it's wailing, moaning. It, it just it doesn't matter how the air is going over the grill. When you start to exceed these velocities, oftentimes you can get a lot of noise. In this application, a lot of times it's easy to blame the terminal devices. You know, there could be other issues causing it, though, so be very careful. If you've got dampers that are throttled down at the inlet to the register or diffuser, you know, that can cause issues as well. It can be a very noisy way. I've, I've known many air balancers try to balance the system that way. It completely voids the NC rating on that type of a diffuser. Now, other issues that you can run into are installation conditions. Two of the most common that you guys will run into is uh, the way that the duct is actually attached to the throat. Simple way to figure out if it's an installation or an air balance issue or if the terminal device itself is just disconnected. If you disconnect it and the noise goes away, it was the terminal device. If the noise is still there, then there's something else that you need to do some investigation on. Throw. Let's talk about throw and spread for a minute, a little bit. Supply register throw and spread are huge factors when it comes into play with the importance of how supply registers and diffusers work and how they're also going to distribute air into the room. You'll notice from the slide that we're showing throw being the distance that the air is being projected from this register till it hits an endpoint. Now that endpoint going from left to right, over on the right, that's where terminal velocity comes in. So say that that's got a 12-foot throw at a terminal velocity of 50 feet per minute. That means that's how far it's going to throw before it hits that 50 feet per minute threshold. So throw is how far the air will go out before reaching its terminal velocity. As we look at spread, that's the maximum width of the airstream as it'll travel once it reaches that point of terminal velocity. So throw is the distance, spread is the width and that's at the corresponding terminal velocity. So that's why that value is so important to have, because without it, throw and spread are kind of meaningless. We don't know what distance or width that that's going to be at inside of a room. Spread is typically going to be referred to by the angle of the veins, or louvers in the register. It's going to be 0, 22, 45 degrees. Depending on how those are set is going to depend on how far the air is thrown. So if you've got a zero degree deflection, the air will throw farther, but it will spread less. If you go 45 degrees, you're going to have a lot more spread, but it won't throw as far. So these factors do affect each other. So let's take a look at this. Let's say we got a supply register, and it's got a phase velocity of 600 feet per minute with airflow moving across the room 10 feet before reaching a velocity of 50 feet per minute. So this is a case. In this instance, the register would have a throw of 10 feet at a terminal velocity of 50 feet per minute. And that will vary depending on manufacturer, how they rate it. Something to keep in mind, any grill manufacturer data that you look at is collected under standard air conditions. Sometimes it's referred to as isothermic conditions. That's 70 degree air, very little humidity. So when you're designing a grill for heating, the air is going to be much lighter. It'll move easier, and it can actually throw up to 30% farther than it would under rated conditions. Now, on the flip side of that, in the cooling mode, the air is going to be heavier. It's going to be more dense, have more weight to it. And you may need to even deduct 30% because of the properties of that air. Something to keep into consideration as you're looking at registers and grills and how to select them. So there are procedures out there that you guys can look for. They'll actually walk you through and help to go through how to properly select. A lot of these are available on the manufacturer's websites. Use their data accordingly. Don't try to use one manufacturer's data for another. Let's take a look at an example of how to select one. Let's say that we have selected a 4 by 12 supply register and design airflow is 100 CFM. Well, let's stop for a second because most guys, if they needed a design airflow value of 100 CFM, would they be going for a 4 by 12? 
guys, if you haven't picked up on my accent yet, I'm from Central Kentucky. And Central Kentucky duck size and rules are four six-inch runs hooked to a 4x10 register that's per ton. So in Kentucky, that's a 4x10. It's easy to sell how guys have got it going. Those guys haven't looked at the register's characteristics. So we're doing a 4x12 for 100 CFM. So what we're going to do is walk through this. We're going to take a look at what the AK of the register is. We're going to take a look at the approximate air velocity coming out of the register. We're also going to look at the pressure drop of the register, the expected throw, and the expected thread, uh, throw from that register. So let's see what we come up with looking at the appropriate engineering data. We said we were going to use a 4x12, which is going to be the center grayed out column. Now the effective area, or the AK, is going to be highlighted there by the 0 0.2058. So we notice we're dealing with 104 CFM. We're shooting for 100, so you know, if we're off by 4 CFM, that's not going to make us or break us. That's going to be within the tolerance of most instruments. Effective area is 0 0.208. The approximate air velocity out of this register is going to be 500 feet per minute. Now as we look at this, if we'd gone with a 4 by 10, we would have had to have raised the face velocity of that register up to 600 feet per minute to get 100 CFM out of it. So it would have been a little noisier. So notice when you're trying to design systems that are a little quieter, go with a little bit oversized grill as long as you're getting the throw that you need out of it. Now as we continue to go down through the characteristics, you're going to notice that as we look at the pressure drop, it's 0 0.016, very low pressure drop. Remember we talked about 0 0.03 being about the max you want to go. The expected throw from this register is going to be 4 feet. So that means that the air will come out of that register, out of that 4 by 12, 4 feet before it hits its terminal velocity of 50 feet per minute. So if you need, if you've got really tall ceilings, you may want to look at a little bit different register. But on average, you want to shoot for terminal velocity that will reach about 75% of the ceiling height. It's a good design rule of thumb. The expected spread from that register is going to be 7 1⁄2 feet, and that's at 50 feet per minute terminal velocity. So that's how far the air will spread at that four foot distance. So if you're trying to cover a pretty good area, not a lot of throw, great register. Great register. If you're trying to throw the air long distances, not a lot of spread, you may want to look for a different floor register in this application. So let's take a look at the engineering data and apply this. We got an office that needs 110 CFM. It's got an 8 inch round ceiling diffuser. There's a table coming up that we're going to look at. We're going to try to figure out what the approximate air velocity out of that diffuser will be. We're going to take a look at what the pressure drop over the diffuser is going to be and also what the expected throw can be from that same diffuser. So the approximate air velocity, we said we had an 8 inch diffuser, an 8 inch round, and we were trying to get 110 CFM out of it. So this is our criteria for starting. Now we want to know what the approximate air velocity out of that register is going to be. You'll notice a lot of this is just lining up and intersecting lines on the data once you use it. So approximate air velocity is going to be 500 feet per minute. Great criteria to go by. The pressure drop, 0 0.016, very low pressure drop in this application. And the expected throw from the diffuser is going to be 7 feet. So what you guys have just done is specified whether this grill will be acceptable for what you need in this type of an application just by looking at the engineering data. Now you can look at this from any other type of aspect that you want to when it comes to different CFM values. If this doesn't fit your needs, you can either go smaller or greater depending on what your requirements actually are. Now, question. Would a 6-inch diffuser handle the same volume of airflow? We need 110 CFM. Would a 6-inch handle it? Well, I'm seeing 700 feet per minute on the far right-hand side maxing out on this table. I'm sure it goes farther than that. It might work. Here's the problem that you guys are going to run into. It's going to be loud. And speaking of loud, let's talk about return air filter grill selections. I know you guys run into a lot of situations where you have return air grills that are just super loud. 
when you're dealing with return air filter grills that have the filter located behind the grill face, the maximum speed of the air that you want to account for, it shouldn't be anything over 400 feet per minute. Now, this is kind of a rule of thumb method that we, we look at, but it gives you some ideas on how to size it. So anytime you're sizing a filter grill, look at the engineering data for the grill that you're considering and look for the 400 feet per minute column. And you'll find a CFM value that's equal to or slightly higher than what you need. That's going to be a good grill to look for. Now, another way that we can do it is take the needed CFM that you have, the required return CFM for that system, and divide that by two. And that's going to give you square inches. So you're allowing two CFM per square inch to determine the needed grill size in square inches. And then that'll need to be converted over. Now, if you've got the square inches, multiply that times the width and the height. Sometimes you may have to do a little bit of uh, movement there. If you need multiple grills, you can split that up into, into multiples, you know, one or two, however you're going to do that. You want to base that up on pressure zones of the house. Uh, it's amazing how many comfort issues are created just by central returns alone. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But you want to multiply the square inches by two, and that's going to give you the expected grill airflow. It's easy to design the grills. Make sure the duct that's running to it size to handle the airflow. Easy to miss. So don't get caught up in the registers and the grills and forget to account for some of the basics, such as the duct. Now, as we continue to go through this, let's say that you guys have got an existing 16 by 20 filter grill. You're going to try to pull 1,000 CFM through it. Will it work? Well, we don't know. Let's take a look. 16 by 20 is 320 square inches. We're going to take that 320 square inches and multiply it times 2 CFM per square inch, and that gives us an approximate capacity for that grill of 640 CFM. So is it going to do it? No. It's not going to make it work. Otherwise, it's going to be above that 400 feet per minute threshold that we talked about, and it's going to be pretty loud and going to be singing. So let's take a look at some of the things that we can do. We take our needed airflow, which is 1,000 CFM, so residential guys, we're dealing with two and a half ton system here. We're going to divide that by two, and that means we need a 500 square inches of area of return grill needed. This is what we're after. So let's see what we come up with as we continue through this. In order to pull 1,000 CFM, there's going to be some roughing in. You're either going to need to increase that grill size to 20 by 25, or you could add another return so that you've got an area that needs to be added. There's often areas that you can refer to that have got generic tables. So if you look at this table that we've got here on the slide, 16 by 20, approximate for a filter grill is going to be 640 CFM. So we would need another size that would handle whatever the difference of that air was. If we wanted to handle full volume of air, we'd have to increase the size to 20 by 25. If we wanted something to take up the distance between those two, which is going to be 360 CFM, we would have to size that grill accordingly. So for, to handle the total volume of air, we're going to have to increase the size of that grill to 20 by 25. So it makes a big difference as we're going through this. So 14 by 14, Notice will be our closest selection. That'll make up the difference for that 16 by 20. It'll keep the system quiet. And another thing that it'll do is it will help you guys get the proper amount of filter surface area that you need. A lot of times filters fail to do what they're designed for because the airspeed going through the grills is so fast that any dirt in the air just gets pulled right through it. So need this needs to be accounted for. This will help your filters work better. If you want to use more restrictive filtering types of medias, such as one-inch pleated, make the filter grills oversized. Size them large. Uh, air is kind of funny. It takes the path of least resistance. If it can't go through a filter, it will go around it. And then we often wonder why some of the situations that we have exist. When dealing with return air grill selection, we're, we're switching gears here. We're, we're moving off of return air filter grills onto just return air grills. Base velocity should be kept in the 300 to 500 feet per minute range. This will help reduce noise through the grill. Guys, often the systems that we run up on, the majority of issues with ducts typically fall on the return side of the system. You know, just as the typical return duct system is undersized, so are a lot of the grills that are attached to those systems. 
So we want to keep the speed of the air to 300 to 500 feet per minute. It's very easy to hear a grill that is undersized. If you've got a lot of noise, low range velocity, there's very irritating noise that will typically accompany that. Many times the noise is going to be in the form of a whistle or a low pitched hum, and it can even resonate through an entire building whenever the fan in the system is operating. You know, how many times have you guys taken a pair of needle nose pliers or a pair of sheet metal tongs and changed the angle of the vanes of the grill to reduce this noise? I think all of us probably have. But this is what we're experiencing, high phase velocities. Now, if you're going to use uh, transfer ducts in a central return application, make sure that you get one that has very low resistance to airflow and you oversize it. A lot of times, just any size grill that will fit into a rough opening is slapped on, and there's not being an account taken into effect of just natural pressure differences being what relieves that pressure. So make sure that you use something that is very low pressure. Now, this may come to, as a shock, but it's important to understand that the air patterns of return grills rarely influence supply, supply register air patterns. I know we used to say, oh, comfort problems at a return, when it's probably the last likely needed solution. Now, there's often times that extra return capacity is needed, but you can see from the illustration here that return grill terminal velocity is only about one and a half times the grill diameter from that face. So return placement is not going to have a lot to do on, the influ on influencing the air patterns of a room. I know a lot of guys see red and they think I'm crazy when this statement gets made because it goes against everything that we've been trained to believe. You know, I was one of the guys who used to think this, as I mentioned previously. It's important to understand, though, that the air patterns of return grills rarely influence supply register air patterns. The supply register design and selection is going to have the biggest impact in this. So as you can see from this illustration, it shows the influence on that return grill to be very limited to very close proximity to the face of the grill. If you guys don't believe me on this, take an anemometer and measure and start pulling the distance away from that grill. You'll see measurements themselves. This is about where this number is going to come into. So it makes a big difference as you're going through and uh, trying to determine what's going to impact the comfort of a room more. So I mentioned that we were going to talk about variable refrigerant system opportunities. When you start getting into multi-stage equipment, uh, full modulating equipment, it's good to understand what happens at registers in the throw as those fans and those systems start to ramp down. A lot of times we'll design registers around full airflow. So say that you're shooting for a value such as 400 to 350 CFM per ton. If you're operating at 100% capacity, that's great. What happens, though, as the capacity drops? Well, the airflow also drops proportionally. And when this happens, you're going to get less airflow from the registers. You're going to get less throw, less spread. Terminal velocity is going to shorten. And you may end up with large areas of stratification within a building that didn't exist when your customers had old equipment. Isn't that a bummer? So when you select registers with increased throw capacity, you may have to use registers that have a higher pressure drop on them for these types of systems. And your customers may experience some noise just to get the systems to do what it needs to. Now, there's some good rules with that. On the home performance side of things, if you're able to control the load of the building, then you can kind of reduce the impacts of that. But that's to an extent. So keep that in mind as you deal with these types of systems. You know, I talked about certain variables that you guys are going to encounter in the field. Regardless of how well you do on the selection of registers and grills, if you have these variables and these factors that you have to overcome, no matter how good of a job you do selecting grills, registers, and diffusers, you're probably not going to be able to overcome this. And you guys see this all the time on systems that you service, maintain, design, and install. Duct leakage is a big issue because it prevents the needed amount of airflow from actually making it to the terminal device. It's getting lost in the airstream. Duct installation is also a crucial aspect of system design, but it's got to be verified instead of assumed. You know, how can you know that a properly selected register is actually working if the design volume of airflow isn't making it to the branch due to improper installation or a poor installation? You don't. You have to measure. Other external factors to consider are high static pressure and weak blowers. On a constant speed fan, belt-driven fan, 
As static pressure goes up, airflow is going to go down. They go opposite of each other. There is an epidemic in our industry, guys, of undersized duct systems, often caused by restrictive filters, ducts, coils, and it plagues the industry right now. If you know how to test and how to correct these issues that create high static pressure, you're going to separate yourselves from the average professional, and you're going to move into the role of a true problem solver. If you have not measured static pressure, I would encourage you to start measuring. The results will shock you and what you're going to find. There's a lot of systems that we're assuming to work just great that aren't because they're too restrict, hooked up to too restricted systems. There's also systems that just have very weak blowers in them. They simply cannot move the needed amount of air that a system needs. In order to make use of the engineering data, when it comes to grills, registers, and diffusers, the design volume has to make it there. So if you haven't looked at fan performance tables, I would encourage you to. See how strong the fans and the systems that you're installing and servicing really are. They might not be doing what you think they are. Another set of external factors that we've got is carbon monoxide safety issues. You might not think about this. Oftentimes there's visual clues that can lead us to this. And this uh, picture on the left, if you guys can make that out, that furnace is sitting up on a box with return grills on the side of it. The problem is it's in an airtight room with a natural draft water heater. That water heater was spilling almost 100% of its flue gas into that room whenever that door was shut due to the depressurization effects. Be very careful as you start changing things around like this. You could unintentionally change airflow patterns and pressures within a building and create a carbon monoxide safety issue. So make sure it's something you count for when you're doing things like this, changing airflows and pressures. Building surface temperatures are another big one. When our customers are paying us to provide them comfort, you know, let's say you guys have designed and installed the perfect system. Uh, it's leak-free, the equipment sized properly, it's done according to a low calculation, proper equipment selection. Your duct system is leak-free. It's insulated as high as you can get it. It's inside the conditioned space. You're delivering the proper amount of airflow. Sounds like a pretty good system, doesn't it? The only problem is your customers are still calling and complaining that they aren't comfortable. Uh-oh. <laughs> One of the primary measurements that your customers use to gauge their comfort is the room temperature. So if you've got issues where the insulation and air leakage in a building are affecting the comfort of your customers, it's going to make a big difference. It's going to make a really big difference. So as we start to look at this, surface temperatures and air temperatures need to be maintained very close to one another. They need to be kept very close. As they start to get farther apart, the way that your customers lose heat and gain heat changes. So it has to be controlled. I would encourage you to study mean radiant temperature, surface temperatures. See how they impact your customer's comfort. If you start trying to overcome that, it makes a difference. And then lastly, one of the things I'd like to leave you guys with is an opportunity that's present to all of you guys. You know, with grills, registers, and diffusers, they are the most noticeable part of any building that comes to the tying in with the HVAC system. There's a huge opportunity you guys to take advantage of this newfound knowledge by offering your customers terminal devices that not only look better than what they currently have, but also perform better. These devices promote better air mixing, and through the principles that you guys have learned today, there's an easy way to look at the area that's often being missed by many HVAC professionals. I would encourage you guys to take advantage of this opportunity It'll help you serve your customers better and help you make more sales while you're at it. I know we've covered a lot, but I wanted to try to make sure that you guys had a very full grasp of the things that come into the, not only the design of grills, registers, and diffusers, but also the things that can influence it. So thank you all for taking your time to be with us today. Uh, I hope you feel it's been worth your investment and your time that you've allowed me to be part of. So at this time, uh, I guess I'll turn this back over to Kyle. Thank all of you all. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, David. That was a, a great presentation, and uh, like you said, a lot of information, but uh, very important information. We do have a few minutes here to, uh, for some Q&As. We have questions already in here, but I'd like to remind everyone that uh, you can still uh, ask your questions in the question box, and we'll get to as many as possible. Uh, first up, is closing off a supply register in an unused room okay to do? If not, why? <laughs> oh, man. There are actually systems that they're selling now that mount inside the register to close off unused rooms. 
that high static pressure issue that we talked about, that will contribute to that. That is not an effective way of saving energy. Uh, it's, it's one of those old wives' tales, one of those myths that has been passed down. As you start closing off the airflow, you start raising that static pressure up. And as the static pressure of the fan increases on constant speed fans, the amount of BTUs that that system is able to deliver drops. It makes a huge difference. So I would not encourage that. Okay. Now, if there's other issues taking place, there, uh, there's other controls and systems that can be installed to do that properly. All right, uh, this next question is for Dave. Do you have a calculation or formula that coincides TTL static pressure to sear? <laughs> There's not quite enough information to do that. That's a fantastic question. Static pressure is more of a diagnostic indicator. You, uh, you have to add other measurements to it. In order to do that, you would have to actually rate the performance of the system. Uh, at NCI, we te teach a concept called CSER and HSER, where what we do is we actually measure the delivered performance of the system and then compare that against what the laboratory ratings are for that system under the conditions that it's tested. So with static pressure, you've got one piece of information, but it, we wouldn't be able to pull all that out of there. Uh, one of the things we do have, though, is uh, it's a blood pressure conversion for static pressure. And a lot of times people understand very simple analogies with high static pressure that, you know, hey, I'm getting ready to have a heart attack. A lot of times guys will go, hey, your HVAC system is getting ready to have a heart attack. So we do have some simple tools like that. But fantastic question. Okay. Uh, next one up for what should I do when a return grill is making a lot of noise? Uh, you get two options. Uh, the slide that's still up about performance grade uh, grills, you can always make uh, an upgrade to that, uh, replace them with a properly sized grill that has a lower face velocity, or if uh, situations are kind of extreme and you're limited on what you can do, you can always take a pair of needle nose pliers or sheet metal tongs and change the angle of the veins. What that does is it actually increases the free area opening and changes the characteristics of that grill. Okay. What are the pros and cons of return air filter grills? Pros and cons, good question. The pros are you can get a lot of filter area in a very tight area. So it's an easy way to get a lot of filter, filter surface area. Uh, the cons are that if you don't get enough surface area for the filter, the dirt will actually bypass it. So it, makes a, it does, there, there's pros that you can get increased filter surface area. The con is, is that you may actually decrease the performance of the filtration. Is it better to have a three-way diffuser facing the exterior walls than blowing into the interior of the occupied space? My personal preference is I could always get a register that blows towards the outside because I'm always trying to condition that largest load. Uh, this is one of the biggest untapped market as HVC professionals that we've not failed, that we failed to look at. And I mentioned this on the building surface temperatures is controlling the load that we are actually that we've actually been uh, commissioned to take care of. There's two ways that we look at this. We, you know, the traditional side of the duct system that we typically deal with is made up of registers, grills, ducts, etc. When you start looking at the building, the building is the part that connects the air coming from the supplies back to the returns. So essentially it is an extension of the duct system. When you look at that kind of that way, all the aspects that have to be into place for a duct system, being airtight, uh, having control of the air and it being insulated properly, need to happen in the house too. When those parameters have been taken into account as well, you, know, you can get a lot more performance-wise out of the building as well, and it helps to deal with a lot of these issues that we've talked about today. So I like straight. I personally like the straight registers. Three ways, depending on how you're trying to de deliver the air into the room, is going to make a big difference on that, and that's where you're going to have to refer essentially back to the engineering data for that particular grill. Uh, but Paul was a little confused about what are you talking about performance-based grills. Can you maybe explain that a little bit? Uh, it's really just uh, commercial grills, uh, anything that is a little bit better than just your standard stamp face grills. Uh, performance grade is just a term that we've always used to 
explain registers and grills that really do what they're supposed to do. Not only that, but they look better. <laughs> uh, a lot of you guys, their cu customers are unhappy with what they've got on the floor, and they'll drop something in that's uh, possibly made out of hardwood or something that is not functioning like it should and end up impacting the system in a negative way instead of a positive way. All right. Another question here is asking about maintenance on filter grills. Is that necessary? And if so, what? Uh, yes. You want to make sure that you keep the veins clear. If those veins start to load up, it starts to reduce the amount of free area. That's a great, great question. Uh, the other thing I meant, forgot to mention this during the pros is that when you're dealing with return air filter grills, is it stops the dirt before it has a chance to get into the duct system. So that's another pro too. Is it it stops right there at the louvers of the veins on the filter grill, and then the filter will catch it. It's a great point. Uh, do registers and diffusers designed for heating only systems work well on cooling systems? Usually not. Um, they're, they're often going to be too restrictive in many instances. Uh, often the heating only grills, they won't get changed when cooling's added, and they're going to have a higher pressure drop off, off of them. It'll typically reduce airflow. And uh, last question here, does air density make a difference when selecting grills, registers, diffusers? Uh, it does. It absolutely does. So when you're looking at the manufacturer's data, be very careful in taking a look at them. All data is typically based on 70 degree air, so the colder the air, uh, the heavier the air, the more dense it is, your throw will be impacted by that and it will not go as far. Typically about 30% is the average that we've seen. Uh, heating will actually travel farther. So as air density changes, so do those properties. So excellent question. All right, sounds good. Well, uh, really appreciate the, uh, the time and the information, David. All the uh, comments coming in here was, uh, was a great job. Everyone uh, uh, was well informed, so I really do appreciate it. That is going to conclude today's webinar. So please join me in thanking uh, David of National Comfort Institute for his presentation, as well as our sponsor, Continental Industries. As you exit today's webinar, Please take a couple minutes to complete our survey. We strongly welcome your detailed comments to help us serve you better. If you have any additional questions or comments, please don't hesitate to contact us at webinars at bnpmedia.com. Please visit webinars.achrnews.com for the archive of this presentation as well as information about our upcoming events. We appreciate your time and hope you found this webinar to be a valuable experience.